What's up, guys? DJ Ravine here. Mr. Bristow. <laughs> and that DJ stands for disc jockey. So since you guys liked the last video so much, we're here to do another DJ Hacks video. So these are a few little tips and tricks that allow you to do some really creative things on the CDJs that may not be that obvious and may not always be the case when you load a track, but when you know how to change these settings, these can really help your workflow. And this is uh, our lovely Studio 4 here at Point Blank in London. But this might be the last time that we'll be filming in this room in particular. Yeah, absolutely, because we've got a brand new DJ studio at the school expansion, and there's going to be a whole load of uh, a new Pioneer kit. In so there. much more. More than here, which is crazy. Very exciting. Anyways, let's get started. So this first one is really related to hot cues, and it's about being able to split hot cue points across multiple tracks. So a lot of people don't realize they can do this and they have the setting set to hot cue auto load, meaning every time they load a track, it loads that track's hot cues, which is great, but it can be annoying if you want to retain a hot cue from another track and you want to play a track, but then actually trigger hot cues from something else. So if you disengage that option, hot cue auto load, it means you can independently load in hot cues per track and leave ones from other tracks. So normally, if we've got this option on, if we go to menu and see under hot cue auto load, if that's on, it means when I go to a new track, it will load the track and the hot cues will automatically load for that track. You can see every time I change tracks, those hot cues all relate to that specific track that I'm in. That's great if all you want to do is jam with a single track, but what you can do is turn that off, go to hot cue auto load on, under menu, turn it off, if you've got it set to record box setting, I think independently per track, you can actually set that option. So for some tracks, you might want it to automatically load. For others, you might not. Now what you'll see is when I go to a new track, the old hot cues are still there from the previous track. So if I went to this A here now, it jumps completely out of the track I'm in. So if ever you press a hot cue and it jumps to a different track, hot cue auto load must be off. If I wanted to load these two hot cues for this particular track, what I would do is press that button and now you can see there's three buttons flashing, which shows me there is A, B and C available for this track. So if I press one of the flashing ones, that's now loaded that hot cue from that track to the button. But if I come out of the call function, now these hot cues are for different tracks. So. So I can jump in and out of two completely different tracks or, or eight different tracks if I really wanted to. Obviously, you've got to be a bit careful if there's tempo differences and you're suddenly jumping to a tune that's completely different speed. It's going to sound a bit weird if you do that live, uh, but it does have a lot of creative potential because you can completely mash up sort of multiple tracks off of a single deck. It's the closest thing you can do to playing multiple tracks on the same deck, really. Yeah. And one really cool way of using this is in conjunction with slip mode, because what that does is you can stay in the main track, press a hot cue if you've got slip mode active, it will trigger that hot cue, but when you let go, it will snap back to the track that you were in the first time. This is our second hack. This is our second hack yeah. now. So if we go to load a tune, what I would need to do is independently load up the, the samples that I want to use, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is load this, and I want to load up some of these hot cues for this track. So I want this one and this one, and maybe this one. So now I've got Mr. Bristow, DJ Ravine, Point Blank Music School. So I've got those three for that track. Now, if I go to a different track, I'm going to play this. Obviously, it's not going to wipe those hot cues that I had just loaded in because hot cue auto load is off. Now what I need to do is play this, but I'm going to put it on slip mode. Now I can punch in Mr. Bristow, DJ Ravine. And the main track keeps playing. Point, 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 point blank music school. So it's like you're jumping between two different tracks effectively, but all on one deck, and you're retaining the phrasing of the main track that's playing. It's almost like they're just punch-in buttons, basically. And, and then the real hack here is that if you want to use that straight as a sampler, you can play a blank track. And now, whenever you press it, it'll be like one-shots. Yeah. So on a lot of all-in-one units and controllers, you've got 
eight hot cue buttons and you might have the option in the software to set those as gate trigger mode so they play like a cue button right where it only plays as long as you're holding it down hot cues don't usually behave like that it's always going to play from that point but start playing the track yeah so this hack is where you want your hot cues to behave like gates. gate trigger mode yeah so it might be you want to do some finger drumming in your set or you want to just do yeah drum over a track or an acapella or something like that so what the process of that would be the firstly load up some individual drum hits so this track has got a couple of drum hits on it so so i've got a kick a hi-hat a snare but as you can see if i'm trying to drum with those i'd have to be faster than the original tempo of the track for it to sound any good because the, it's going to start playing the rest of it so what i want is for that to act more like gate trigger mode so it only plays when i hold the button down so if you export a silent track effectively you play the silence that's your main track put it on slip mode and trigger your drums and it always then snaps back into the silence so it's like a, a workaround to make those act like gate trigger mode really so on this tune here if i load this this has just got a load of silence in it so that's my main track it's silent put it on slip mode now my drum hot cues only play when i press the button but as soon as i stop touching the button it, it goes off yeah or you could do it better than that if you want well yeah <laughs> So th this is like four minutes of silence. So it's not going to run out in the time that you might do a little routine with some drums on a, on a CDJ. So before hot cues and slip mode were able to be combined like this on CDJs, there used to be hot cues on, on a CDJ 1000, for example, with like three hot cue buttons. So the only way to get them to stop would be to press the cue button or the play button after the button. So, so you can go. like that but it's obviously a lot more faffing around having to press the cue button every time you've triggered something this way of doing it with the silence it's just you've got more hands free to trigger the other sounds basically you know somebody is going to comment and be like no that was how it was real djing back in the day <laughs> well yeah you could produce your own drums from scratch out of metal and sheepskin if you really want to keep it real i mean this is obviously more of a kind of performance like controllerist kind of thing that you're going to use these for obviously a lot of djs don't use their CDJs like this. You have got other options like a DJS 1000 where it's got, you know, 16 pads and that's designed for playing drums. You know, if you haven't got the budget for one of those, but you've, you're playing on CDJs, you can add a lot of flavor to a set by doing some drum beats over, as I said, acapellas or even over the track itself. Next up is another really simple one and it's turning tag lists into playlists. Yeah. So tag list is like really useful when you're doing a set, you can tag tracks that then appear under that tag list button. It's, you know, like in the olden days with record boxes, we used to pull out records and think, right, I'm going to play a few tunes ahead of where I am now. And I know what records I'm going to play by lifting them out of the box. Tag list is the digital equivalent. So you might be searching for a track, you, you know, you, f you find something you think you're going to play and then you think, well, actually, I'm going to tag that so save it for later save it for later tag it tag it you know tag a load of tunes and then they appear under the tag list button so you can come back to those during the set but what a lot of people don't realize is if you eject that hard drive or shut the deck down you're going to lose that tag list and it might be a gig you've you've tagged loads of tunes and they really work well together so it's worth saving those as a playlist because then when you get back home you can change you know save that playlist back into your record box library so all it involves is going to tag list, pressing the menu button, and it actually brings up the tag list menu, which then lets you either remove all the tracks from the tag list or create a playlist from that tag list. So I press OK. Now it says complete new playlist saved. So if I go to my playlist area, all the way down at the bottom, I should find the tag list is saved and that's permanently saved to that drive. So it means next time I load this drive up on a CDJ, I can access it or put my drive into Recordbox and, and get those playlists off. 
So this next one is really just a hack where if you haven't even used Rekordbox, you've just dragged music onto a drive or a USB stick, you've not put it in the software or exported a playlist, you've just got music in a folder on your hard drive. Prior to the CDJ 3000s, when you'd load those tracks up from the folder option on the active categories section, it would let you play the track, but it wouldn't have the overview of the waveform or, you know, it wouldn't have beat grids. Now the 3000s, if I load a track here from folder, this is not through, you know, process with Rekordbox at all. It actually takes a few seconds, but if you can see, it builds the waveform and has added a beat grid to the track. Well, it's now building the overview and then it adds beat grids. So really you could get away with not even using Rekordbox and still have the ability to create quantized loops and have the beat grid and the BPM value being accurate. It's just obviously an advantage to process the tracks in advance because when you load it, it happens straight away. What is quite amazing though is if I go to a track, even though I've turned the deck off, come back to it a week later, when I load that track from folder again, it has got the beat grid and the overview there straight away. So it's obviously saving that data somewhere. You know, it's a backup having tunes on your drive without them being processed with Rekordbox. Because if your Rekordbox database collapses, you can still go to the folder option on the CDJ and access some files. Whereas how many people have had that nightmare where everything's encased within their Rekordbox database, something's gone wrong on their database, often through their own fault, I've got to say, where someone's moved things around on their computer and accidentally corrupted it. Or, yeah, or unplugged it without ejecting it. Yeah, and then it means they're, they're like, I can't access anything now, I'm completely locked out of all music. But if you've gone and put some music under folder or just on the drive, you can just go to folder and there's your, all your folders with all your music, irrespective of, of the Rekordbox database. Obviously, you still want to Rekordbox your stuff because you load a track instantly, you have everything there, you've got your hot cues. Yeah. Uh, also, a lot of the times, when I load a lot of my songs, the BPMs are not correct or the beat grids are not correct. You can fine tune all of that stuff. Yeah. But this is great as a backup. Yeah. Obviously, worth noting, you can still save hot cues and cue points to tracks that haven't been processed with Rekordbox and it will still remember them. It's just, yeah, obviously an advantage to have the waveforms and beat grids as accurate as you can. All right, and then the final hack that we have today. Yep. It's a classic one. It's an old school classic, but a lot of people don't know about this. And it always amazes students when I show them this. And it's helped me out on a lot of occasions when I've done gigs and I didn't bring a microphone with me. And whoever's doing a speech or, you know, it's a wedding and someone's like, we, we, need, a, we need to do an announcement. The bar closes in five minutes. Yeah. I haven't got a microphone with me, but I've always got a pair of headphones with me. And you can use a pair of headphones as a makeshift microphone. Obviously, this is never gonna be as good as a proper microphone. It's a backup, it's a hack where you've, you're, you're stuck and you need something to you know, amplify someone's voice. Even though this is meant to send sound out of the headphone output, if we plug the jack cable from my headphones into the mic in, I've got mic levels one and two because there's two different microphone inputs to this mixer and i can also eq it with the high and the low eq and then i need to activate the microphone now one of the cans acts like a microphone amazing yeah so really you know come in number two your time is up last orders at the bar please etc it's just a very good sort of hack and you know, it's gonna teach you a lesson that you should probably have a microphone with you the next time because it's never gonna be as good sound quality as, as a mic, but. And then on top of that, you can affect it as well. Yeah, of course, yeah. So if you assign your effects to the mic, then you've got stuff like echo, obviously it's gonna add a bit of flavor to it. Hello. 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 I mean, that doesn't sound that bad. Some people do that and, you know, they add a little bit of a layer over their tune that they're doing just to give it a bit more of a, you know, bespoke sort of feel. It gives it like a lo-fi vibe as well. Yeah. Or, you, you know, the roll effect. So if we record something, make sure it's like set to a specific value. Obviously, the loop length's a bit wrong, so I need to change the time value. Hours of fun. <laughs> Who needs music? 
Make it yourself. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for watching this video. A lot of these great little tips to help your workflow and your DJing, and just some stuff to you know get you out of some sticky situations. Yeah, it's always good to know these little things. It's always worth investigating the settings of a CDJ in the menu. You know, there might be things that are obviously telling you what they do, and you might not have thought to look for it. Well, I showed you this one today. If you hold down the utility button here, you get all these other settings here as well. Bonus tip. Bonus tip. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you go and check out pointblankmusicschool.com to find out more about our courses, degrees, and learn DJing, of course, from Mr. Bristow himself. But this is DJ Ravine. And Mr. Bristow. We're out of here. We'll see you next time. Does that hurt? <laughs>